The Nikon River extends from its headwaters in British Columbia to the confluence of the Bering Sea off the coast of Alaska. Spanning an area of 330,000 square miles, the Yukon River watershed is home to many indigenous people. My grandmother used to tell me all the time, you know, you respect that river. Don't ever disrespect that river. She said it's the strongest thing that we have amongst our people. She said that river will feed you. It brings you food. When I was a kid, back in the 60s, man, we had a lot of fish. And a lot of fish, lots of fish. All kinds of fish. Grayling, lost two fish every dog got to take. Pikes, some pikes were about that big, some of them. Yukon for transportation and picking berries and hunting. I love Hooper Bay. I could never see myself living anywhere else. Growing up here <clears throat> as, a, as a child, it was my greatest moment in life. It's all just beautiful here. I love it here. My home. The Yukon River watershed has experienced tremendous changes brought on by Western influences. The military, mining, and other industries have left a legacy of contamination that threatens the lifestyle of our people. <laughs> My father and his family are originally from Baimut, um, which is located next to um, a long-range radar site, a U.S. Air Force base. Without our knowledge, um, they had been spilling PCBs, um, gasoline, diesel, um, DDTs. The scientists that we were working with said our old, old people should not be eating tomcods, um, mussels, and anything beyond that, we would, it would be harming um, us. How do you tell a people that have relied on these foods for hundreds and hundreds of years that you can no longer eat them? For centuries, indigenous people have lived in balance with the natural environment. You know, a long, long time ago, there was, no, there was no trash. We always kept our campsites, our fish camps and everything else, we always, always kept them clean. As Western society's influence grew within the watershed, villages were introduced to solid and hazardous wastes. Things have changed over the years and we've started using more, you know, oil. Boats started appearing in um, planes. Probably 1953, a store we start that they bring in a lot of grocery and then uh, we start having a lot of cans on the everywhere. Just people just throw it everywhere. The U.S. Air Force. Um, they, they, you know, they, they have every argument under the sun um, to not take responsibility for the contaminants that they have spilled. And even we as Native people, 
uh, were guilty, not only here in Nenana, but up and down the river. People, when they changed their gear grease and outboard motors, did it right in the river. Over time, contaminants have had a large impact on the watershed. People asked me to pack water, so we, I pack water from the Yukon River and drink it. And then later on, uh, and the mining and a lot of other things going on above. And then uh, we, don't, uh, we don't trust the water anymore. If you don't take care of the, the river, that the, you know, the river is not always going to uh, do as well for you as it, you know, it has how, that it always has. And this kind of made, kind of woke us up to, hey, we don't want our river to, you know, to be in that, in that position. So, you know, that's what stemmed the first, uh, first summit. Tribes and First Nations directly affected by contaminants were compelled to take action. Thirty-six tribes, I believe, came together in my hometown, Galena. Our goal was to, to uh, start from the drainage into the Yukon. So we had two different countries that's dealing with the same problem. Uh, the next summit was in Brooksbrook, Teslin. And there, we formally start signing the accord between the tribes. The accord is an agreement between tribes and First Nations to work together to protect the watershed. The question was asked, what would the leadership like to see within 50 years? And that question sparked a very quick response, which was, we want to be able to drink water directly from the Yukon River. And as soon as it was said by one of the leaders, it was approved by consensus. People coming together and voicing their concern is really making a difference. It's just, it's just awesome. The Yukon River Intertribal Watershed Council began developing programs to respond to the environmental concerns voiced by tribes and First Nations. The Yukon River Intertribal Watershed Council has been in existence for 10 years. Within those 10 years, we've seen very rapid growth. Currently, the Yukon River Intertribal Watershed Council operates four main programs, which include water quality monitoring, backhaul and solid waste, Circuit Rider, and Brownfields Tribal Response. When we first heard about the Brownfields opportunities available through the EPA, we applied for it in 2004, and since then we've been really building the Brownsfield Tribal Response Program as the mechanism to deal with contaminated site issues in the watershed. Brownfield? I never heard of it. Brownsfield? I don't know some British agent or something. Just a field with brown and yellow grass all over. It's beautiful. All Alaska communities have brown fields in one way or another. In basic terms, brown fields are contaminated sites that can be cleaned up and then the land can be reused or recycled into something else. Um, the most common types of brownfield sites we see in the Yukon River watershed are old dumps, mining camps, um, old tank farms, canneries, and other sort of abandoned buildings that may have some hazardous substances in them. A brown field. Maybe I'm saying bad word. A field full of a lot of dirt. <laughs> brown field. One of the 
sticking points to identify a true brownfield is very often whether or not there's a viable, responsible party. Is there somebody who can actually take care of the problem who is responsible? Sites that are not brownfields are active sites, sites with no known or perceived contamination, or sites with little or no redevelopment potential. Brownfields are bulk. The dictionary definition of a brownfield, if you look into environmentalist dictionary, is an area, contaminated piece of land that could be cleaned up and reused again. The role of our Brownfields Tribal Response Program is to help build the capacity of tribes in the watershed to effectively respond to their contaminated site issues. We do this by providing communities with hazardous waste training, working with tribes to identify their potential brownfield sites, and by conducting environmental site assessments of the highest priority sites. Currently the Brownfields Program works with 36 villages. We have identified 229 potential brownfield sites. Four of those sites have moved to the next stage in the Brownfields redevelopment process, which is assessment. A phase one environmental site assessment is to go out to a site and to look around to see what's on the property. This is mostly just waste. I don't see any drums. I don't see any transformers in this room. I see some old light ballasts, which could or could not have PCBs in them. Um, I'm looking for things like insulation, anything that could have contained asbestos or anything that could have t contained lead. I think the biggest issues here are the waste management. If more information is needed after a phase one, the next step is a phase two assessment. A phase two is more in depth and often involves actual sampling of the contamination. Assessments help us to understand the best approach to cleaning up sites. It's a very slow process, and it's really dictated by um, how much money you have to spend. In the rural communities, what we found is, is very often there's a lack of the funding necessary to take a brownfield project through to completion. It's one thing to identify a brownfield problem. It's another thing to actually be able to identify an entire plan to take that problem from where it is today through the assessment and cleanup phase actually into a redevelopment that benefits the entire community. All the work that we've been able to accomplish would not have been possible without the help of the tribes and First Nations along the Yukon River. They are the ones that are most knowledgeable about the sites that are of concern to them and they're the ones that have the most invested in getting them cleaned up. The importance of this site is that I would really like to get it cleaned up because of the uh, our drinking water facilities right here, our ground well. It happens to be one of the top priorities, being that it's in, a, it's in a public school location, it's a drinking water well, and this is like the, the, uh, the public area of Kaikuk. Cleaning up and reusing brownfields can benefit public health as well as the local economy. Another important um, element that differentiates brownfields from uh, just a contaminated site is that there's a reuse goal. So that once the brownfield site is cleaned up, there's an intention on the part of the community to reuse that land for something else, whether it be a subsistence habitat or a new place for infrastructure, that type of thing. So there's always a reuse goal associated with a brownfield site. One property in a neighborhood or in a community can have an incredible effect on an entire block or a neighborhood. My vision is to have more resources go into um, the state of Alaska and I think the Watershed Council is kind of the, one of the best mechanisms to bring awareness to the smaller villages. Tribes and First Nations have made progress towards improving the health of the watershed. With the support of the Environmental Protection Agency, State of Alaska, and other environmental leaders, we will be able to continue this work and achieve our 50-year vision to drink water directly from the Yukon River. I'll guarantee you nobody changes their 
uh, gear grease in the river anymore. We're fighting to save the Yukon River. Everybody's agreed. The one advice that I can give to other communities is that they build capacity. In order for something to work, you need to actually go out there and do the work yourself and make it real, you know. I have a granddaughter that's coming up and I would like to clean up these areas so that she would be able to, um, I would like to see a playground put in this site and maybe in the future see my little granddaughter play there. I think one key thing uh, for younger generations of people who are from the watershed and who care about the watershed, I think what they can do is help prevent future contaminated sites. Yeah, that's a